All right, please open to Romans chapter 11. And we concluded last time we were looking at Romans chapter 11 and verse 5. And uh, I just want to pick it up there and, uh, and talk a little bit more about that verse. So Romans chapter 11 and verse 5 says, Even so, then, at this present time also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. Um, and so we talked last time about how this remnant in verse 5 is uh, is a part of the little flock in, in the nation of Israel. But there are many who, because of that phrase, election of grace, they think this is the church, the body of Christ, or some would narrow it down to, um, they say it's Jews in the church, the body of Christ. But the context clearly is speaking about Israel. And also, as I mentioned last time, the word remnant is left over from something that previously existed, but has now been destroyed or removed, uh, but there's a remnant remaining. But the body of Christ at this point is not something left over, it's something new. So the word remnant wouldn't at all fit the church of body of Christ. Uh, but I want to talk a bit more about this phrase, election of grace. Because um, again, many, because of that phrase, they think this must be the body of Christ, especially the word grace. So first of all, the word election. In the scriptures, there are four elect. So let's uh, turn back to Isaiah chapter 42. Isaiah chapter 42 and verse 1 says, Behold my servant, whom I uphold, mine elect, in whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. So the one being spoken of here is Jesus Christ, and he is referred to as mine elect. So the, uh, the first elect that we're going to see in the scriptures is Jesus Christ. Also look in 1 Peter chapter 2, 1 Peter chapter 2, and Gene Gross, would you read verse 6? 1 Peter, right? 1 yep. Peter 2, 6. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, behold, I lay in Sion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. So this verse again is speaking about Jesus Christ, and it refers to him as elect. So again, number one, the when we talk about the elect in the word of God, number one is Jesus Christ. Then look at 1 Timothy chapter 5. And while we're turning to 1 Timothy chapter 5, I'll also mention that uh, in Calvinism, they speak of the elect as those whom God chose before the foundation of the world to be eternally saved. But that can't possibly be the meaning of the word elect in the word of God, because Jesus Christ was not elected to receive eternal life. So that doesn't fit with him at all. Okay, then the second one in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5, Richard, would you read verse 21? 1 Timothy 5, 21. Okay. One moment. I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels, that thou observe these things without preferring one before another, doing nothing by partiality. Okay, and so notice the mention here of elect angels. So number two is there are elect angels in the word of God. And then uh, go to Romans, Romans chapter eight, 
And in Romans chapter 8, Dennis, would you read verse 33? Romans 8, 33. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. And so when it speaks of God's elect here, it's clearly referring to members of the body of Christ. So number three, elect, is the church, a body of Christ. Then also look in Colossians chapter three. Colossians chapter three. And uh, would Dan or Laura read verse 12, Colossians chapter 3, verse 12? Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved bowels of mercies, <clears throat> kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. All right, so where he said, uh, speaks of the elect of God in this verse, again, clearly that's members of the body of Christ. Okay, and then the fourth one, uh, go back to Isaiah chapter 45. Isaiah chapter 45, and would Dan or Lisa read verse 4? Isaiah chapter 45 and verse 4. For Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel, mine elect, I have even called thee by thy name. I have surnamed thee, though thou hast not known me. Okay, so it refers to Israel, mine elect. Um, so clearly in the scriptures, um, when we speak of the four elect, one of them is Israel. And then uh, one more verse in Isaiah chapter 65. Isaiah 65 and Sally, would you read verse nine? Isaiah chapter 65, verse nine. And I will forth a seed out of Jacob and out of Judah and inheritor of my mountains and mine elect shall inherit it and my servants shall dwell there. All right, so again, in this verse, when he speaks of mine elect, he's speaking of Israel. So when Romans chapter 11 and verse five speaks of an election of grace, again, there are four, four elect in the scriptures. Jesus Christ, number two, angels, elect angels, number three, the church body of Christ, and number four, Israel. So, um, so it's completely appropriate to refer to Israel as the elect or an election. Um, and so it's clear uh, at this point in Romans 11, 5, that when he speaks of Israel being God's elect, he's talking about believers in Israel, the, the little flock. Uh, he's already made that clear in Romans earlier that not all Israel is Israel. So God, um, at this point, does not consider unbelieving Israelites to be Israel. So, so it's the believers who are the election according to grace. Look in uh, First Peter chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1, and Sharon, would you read verse 2? Uh, one, two, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you, and peace be multiplied. All right, so Peter is writing to members of the little flock in Israel, the remnant in Israel, and in verse two, he refers to them as elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. And then also look in 1 Peter chapter 5, and Dominic, would you read verse 13? 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 13. 1 Peter 5, 13, the church that is at Babylon, together with you, saluted you 
and so doth Marcus, my son. Okay, so uh, elected together with you. And again, he's referring both the church at Babylon is our Jews who've been scattered, and then uh, also the ones that he's writing to. So elected together with you. Again, referring to members of the little flock. Uh, go back to Romans and uh, first of all, look in chapter 9 in Romans. Romans chapter 9 and Gabrielle, would you read verse 11, Romans 9, 11. Romans 9, 11. For the children <clears throat> being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, but the purpose of God according to election might stand, <clears throat> not of works, but of him that calleth. Okay, so before we come to chapter 11, Paul, uh, back here in chapter 9, already referred to God's purpose according to election in the nation of Israel. So God formed the nation of Israel, and he had the right to elect whomever he wanted to fulfill his purpose. So uh, as we see here in, in verse 11, before Esau and Jacob were even born, God already made a choice. So before being born, of course, uh, Esau and Jacob had not done anything good nor evil, and yet God chose Jacob. So verse 11 again says, for the children, referring to Esau and Jacob, being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. So the choice or the election here was not based on their works in any way whatsoever, because neither of them had done anything good or evil. And so God chose Jacob instead of Esau, not because Jacob was a better person or because of his works, but because it suited the purpose of God. God had a purpose and he made an election according to that purpose. So it was God's purpose uh, previously to choose Abraham from among all the men on earth and then to choose Isaac rather than Ishmael. And then in the same way, God elected Jacob, not Esau. That, that phrase, purpose of God in verse 11, tells us that God purposed or determined within himself that he would do something. And so Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, none of them were chosen because of their works or because they were good people. Um, they didn't have any, any sort of right to be chosen. They were chosen due to God's deliberate purpose and determination. Uh, Calvinists love, there are a few things they love in Romans chapter 9, um, and looking at verse 11 in particular, they love this passage um, and use it to try to prove that God, according to his sovereign will, shows some people to have eternal life and others to go into eternal damnation before he created the heaven and the earth. Um, so it's important to notice that what, what God's purpose according to election concerns here. It's not dealing with some individuals getting eternal life and others going into eternal damnation. His purpose in verse 11 has to do with, and, and in this passage, has to do with choosing Abraham and then Isaac and then Jacob um, and then their descendants, according uh, or to be to be his nation, they're chosen to be his nation, not chosen to have eternal life. So Paul has already made it clear that um, going back even to chapter two in Romans, that not all Israelites would uh, would receive eternal life. So that's a different issue. 
there's an issue of being the, the chosen nation, the, the favored nation, that's one thing, but having individuals having eternal life is a different issue. And here in Romans 9 and also in Romans 11, Paul's not talking about individual Israelites having eternal life or not having eternal life. He's talking about the little flock being the elect because they believe the gospel of the kingdom and through their faith, they become a part of God's elect remnant. So just as you and I, um, there is a time in, in our past, in our lives, when we were not members of the body of Christ. So we didn't have any of the blessings that come as being members of the body of Christ. But when we believed and were justified by faith, then we become members of the body of Christ, and then we receive all the blessings given to members of the body of Christ. So it's the same thing with the remnant in Israel. Okay, then uh, look back in Romans chapter 11. And so that phrase in Romans 11, 5, election, uh, election of grace. So clearly the word election would be an appropriate way to refer to the little flock in Israel. Um, and then it's also appropriate to use the word grace <clears throat> referring to the little flock. So they're, they're the election of grace. Um, so, for example, look at Hebrews chapter 13. And so we have to be careful in our, uh, the words that we use and the way that we use them, because there are some who misunderstand what we're teaching, and they think that we are saying that there was never any grace until this dispensation of the grace of God. And also that only, <coughs> excuse me, um, that only we um, have to do with grace, that Israel doesn't have to do with grace. And of course, that's not true at all. We don't have to read much scripture to find out that's not the case. So he Hebrews chapter 13, and Aaron, would you read verse 25? Hebrews 13, 25. Um, Hebrews 13, 25, grace be with you all, amen. Okay, and so of course he's writing here to the Hebrews, not to Gentiles, not to the body of Christ, but to Hebrews, and he says, grace be with you all. Then uh, look in 1 Peter chapter 4, 1 Peter chapter 4, and Pam, would you read verse 10, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10? Okay, Pam may not be able to read, so let me read 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 10. As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another, as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So Peter again is writing to Hebrews, to the little flock, and he tells them to be good stewards of the manifold grace of God. And then 1 Peter chapter 5, and would Tim or Jean read verse 12? 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 12. Okay, 1 Peter 5, 12. By Silvanus, a faithful brethren to you, as I suppose, I have written briefly, exhorting, the, uh, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God wherein ye stand. So Peter speaks of the true grace of God wherein ye stand. So in, in uh, Romans 5, Paul says that we, members of the body of Christ, have a standing in grace, but so does the remnant in Israel. They have, they, they're standing in the grace of God. Okay, then 2 Peter chapter 1, and uh, Pakinatan, would you read verse 2? 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 2. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God 
and of Jesus our Lord. Okay, so Peter again writing to the little flock says, grace be multiplied unto you. And then uh, 2 John chapter 3, and I, I want to, I could just read one verse and make this point, but I want to read a few verses uh, as we're doing to show you that many, many times the word grace is used in reference to the remnant or the little flock in Israel. All right, so 2 John, and Meg, would you read verse 3? The second John three, grace be with you, mercy and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father in truth and love. Okay, and so John, again, writing to the little flock or the remnant in Israel says, grace be with you. And then the book of Jude and Akun, would you read verse four? The book of Jude and verse four. For there are certain men crept in unawares, who were before of all, of all ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness, and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so Jude warns about those ungodly men that turn the grace of God into lasciviousness. And then uh, one more and that is in the book of Revelation, chapter 1. Revelation, chapter 1 and verse 4. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. And so these seven churches we've talked about in some detail in the past. But these seven churches are, are Jewish churches seeking the kingdom of God on the earth. Um, so again, part of the little flock or the remnant in, his, in Israel. And he says again in verse 4, grace be unto you. Okay, then go back to Romans 11. So that phrase in Romans 11, 5, uh, el the election of grace, that absolutely is an appropriate way to refer to the little flock or the remnant in Israel. Um, they're, as we've seen, clearly referred to as an election and clearly um, also associated with grace many times. Uh, and then finally, it should be noted in Romans eleven five that again, that it says there is a remnant at this present time. So it doesn't say that God is forming a remnant by adding Jews to the body of Christ, but he said there is a remnant. So again, uh, in my, my main point in going to this verse at this time is that it's clear that there were two distinct groups, the church of body of Christ and the little flock were both on earth at the same time. God didn't remove the little flock or the remnant when the dispensation of the grace of God began. <clears throat> um, and so again, that doesn't prove that the same thing will happen in the future, but it does prove that you can't use the argument um, that you can't have the body of Christ and the remnant in Israel or the little flock in Israel, you can't have them on the earth at the same time because they were on the earth at the same time. Okay, then in Romans 11, let's go down to verse 12. So Romans 11, 12, now if the fall of them is the riches of the world and the diminishing of them, the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? And so he says that the, the fall of Israel resulted in the riches of the world. And that the riches of the world refers back to the salvation that he speaks of in verse 11. So verse 11 says, I say then, have they, 
referring to Israel, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but rather through their fall, through Israel's fall, salvation is come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. And so in uh, again in verse 12, when he talks about the riches of uh, the riches of the Gentiles, he's referring to that salvation that he mentioned in verse 11. Um, and so this was completely unexpected according to prophecy. According to prophecy, the Gentiles were to be saved through the rise of Israel. Turn to Genesis chapter 22. Genesis chapter 22, and Jean Gross, would you read verses uh, 17 and 18? Genesis 22, 17 and 18. That in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. So God here is speaking to Abraham, and he promises him, in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. So the nations, according to prophecy, the nations of the earth were to be blessed through Israel. And then uh, turn to Isaiah chapter 60, 6, 0. Uh, Isaiah chapter 60, and Richard, would you read the first three verses in Isaiah 60? Okay. <clears throat> Arise, shine. For light, light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness for people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. And the Gentiles shall come to thy light, and kings to the brightness of thy rising. So, according to prophecy, the Gentiles were to be saved through the rise of Israel. Verse one says, arise, shine. And then he says, the Gentiles shall come to thy light. But when we come to Romans, if you go back to Romans chapter 11, in verse 12, it says, now if the fall of them be the riches of the world, so what Paul teaches here in Romans 11, again, is completely unexpected. Prophecy says the Gentiles will be saved through the rise of Israel. And Paul now says that salvation has come to the Gentiles through the fall of Israel. Uh, and so these riches that he speaks of in verse 12 did not come to the Gentiles or did not come to the world by prophecy. It was, again, completely unexpected. Um, instead, these riches come through the fall of Israel. They come uh, and, and they're revealed in the mystery that was revealed to Paul. They, they come about due to a new dispensation that's given to Paul. Uh, and so, again, this is what, what he writes about here uh, in verses 11 and 12 is a completely new and unexpected thing. Okay, Paul also, looking at Romans chapter 11, verse 12, says that the diminishing of Israel resulted in the riches of the Gentiles. The, the diminishing of Israel is sometimes uh, on some, some charts, dispensational charts, there is a line going down in through the book of Acts, and that's uh, said to be a diminishing um, that takes place over, over time. But the diminishing here refers to the fact that Israel had diminished 
down to a remnant. So it's not talking about a gradual phasing out of that program, but it's talking about, again, that Israel once was a, a large nation with many people, but they've now diminished down to the, the remnant that he speaks of in verse five. The majority of the nation of Israel had fallen from their special place of blessing and privilege. So only a remnant or a little flock remained. And so that's the diminishing. And then Paul says that the Gentiles uh, will be even more blessed through Israel's fullness. So he says again in verse 12, now if the fall of them, the fall of Israel, be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them, the diminishing of Israel, the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. So there will be even more Gentile blessing with Israel's fullness. Now the word fullness is an important word later in the chapter, as many of you know, and we, we've talked about that and I'll mention it again. So it's good to take careful note of the meaning of the word fullness here in verse 12. First of all, if you look at verse 12, you can see that the word fullness in verse 12 is the opposite of the fall and it's the opposite of the diminishing. So one day Israel will be restored to the position from which she fell and that's Israel's fullness. And one day, um, as Paul says later in the chapter, all Israel will be saved. So they will no longer be diminished to only a small remnant, but the nation will be saved. And again, that's Israel's fullness. Um, turn back to the book of Zechariah chapter eight. We, we could look at a number of scriptures concerning this point, but uh, we'll just look at this one. Zechariah chapter eight, and Dennis, would you read verses 22 and 23? Zechariah chapter eight, verses 22 and 23. Yea, many people and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and to pray before the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, in those days it shall come to pass that 10 men shall take hold out of all languages of the nations, even shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, we will go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. Okay, so many people and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem. And then verse 23, he talks about how Gentiles will grab, uh, take hold of the skirt of a Jew and say, we will go with you for we have heard that God is with you. So when Israel's fullness comes, when they're restored to that special position and they're, they're no longer diminished, but the nation is saved, that will, as Paul says in Romans uh, 11 and verse 12, that will be a, a time of great blessing and salvation for Gentiles. Okay, then let's go back to Romans 11. And uh, moving down to verse 15, Romans chapter 11 and verse 15. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? So if you compare verse 12 with verse 15, the casting away in verse 15 relates back to the fall and the diminishing in verse 12. And then the reconciling of the world in verse 15 relates to the riches of the Gentiles and, um, and the riches of the world in verse 12. And then the receiving of them in verse 15 relates back to their fullness in verse 12. So the fullness is when God will again receive Israel. 
Um, and then the, the life from the dead in verse 15 relates back to the how much more in verse 12. So the, the how much more is in verse 15, life from the dead. So the, the fullness of Israel in verse 12, again, has to do with the reversal of Israel's fall and the reversal of their diminishing. So Israel will be restored to the position from which she fell and Israel will increase rather than diminish. Israel will be received again. Um, her, so her current state, as it says in verse 15, is Israel has been cast away. But there will come a time when Israel will be received again. Uh, and so the, the fullness referred to in verse 12 is the, the completion and the fulfillment of God's purpose for Israel. When all of the promises given to Israel will be fulfilled. All the covenants made with Israel will be, fu be fulfilled. Uh, all of the blessings promised to Israel will be realized. Okay, then let's go down to verse 21 in Romans 11. Verse 21, for if God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not thee. So if God didn't spare the natural branches, and he didn't, um, we, we just read that they fell. They were diminished. They cast away. So God did not spare the natural branches. So then Paul says in verse 21, then he surely won't spare thee. Uh, and thee is the church, the body of Christ. So Paul makes a point in verse 21, so you had better take heed. Uh, Israel had a more secure position in this olive tree that he speaks of in this chapter because they were the natural branches. So the, the natural branches surely had an advantage over graft in branches. And the church of body is Christ um, is graft in branches. And so the warning again in verse 21, take heed. Um, so the position of the church body of Christ is not really so secure. If the natural branches can be broken off, then certainly graft in branches could be broken off. The, the natural branches come naturally from the root. But the Gentile branches, the, the church of body of Christ, had to be grafted into the tree. It doesn't come naturally from the root. Um, and so, as I'm sure you all are aware, verse 21 is often used to deny the eternal security of believers. But when you look at this context carefully, God did not take away eternal life or take away justification from believing Jews. The believing Jews were not broken off. They're, they're the remnant, according to the election of grace, mentioned in verse 5. So Peter, James, and John, for example, God did not take away their eternal life or take away their justification. Uh, so we have to remember that the context of Romans 11 is dispensational, referring to Israel being cut off and then the body of Christ being grafted in. And, and it's national. It has to do with a nation being broken off from that olive tree. So this chapter, like we looked at briefly in chapter 9, is not talking about individuals being justified or individuals receiving eternal life. Paul already talked about that in detail back in chapter three and chapters three and four. So verse 21 in Romans 11 is not talking about individuals having eternal life. 
So again, the, the natural branches that he speaks of here did not have eternal life. He's referring to unbelieving Israelites. They never had eternal life. Um, and so they didn't lose it because they never had it. This passage is speaking about Israel losing a position of national privilege and blessing. So it's the nation that's cut off. So they, they lost their position of being God's agency of blessing on the earth. We, we read a couple passages earlier that it was through the nation of Israel and through the rise of Israel that Gentiles were to be saved. So that was a special privilege, a special position given to Israel. But because of their unbelief, they again lost that position of being God's agency of blessing on the earth. Damn. So first, yeah. Real quick question. So in other words, Israel was broken off because of unbelieving Israel. Yes. Yeah, so the little flock was not broken off. There again in verse 5, they're the election according to grace or the remnant. Okay? So so verse 21 again is a warning to the body of Christ that the body of Christ could be removed from her position of privilege as God's agent of blessing on the earth. So we now in the church of body of Christ, we are now the ones that have the message of salvation, that have the gospel, um, that, that people ought to come to us or we ought to go to them to tell them about salvation. But Paul's warning in verse 21 that the body of Christ could lose that position. And uh, he's going to elaborate upon that more in the next verse, which we will look at next week. Uh, but verse 21, as we have spoken about previously, um, I believe clearly refutes the idea of an imminent rapture or an imminent coming of Christ. Because again, the idea of an imminent rapture or imminent coming of Christ is that it could be at any moment, could be tonight. Um, but clearly, as you look at verse 21, something must happen. And, and we'll talk again more about that next week. Something must happen. And if that happens, then the body of Christ will not be spared. So the, the body of Christ would then be removed from its position in the olive tree that he speaks of in this chapter. And that would then end the dispensation of the grace of God. So what he's talking about in this passage, he's warning the body of Christ that just as the natural branches were broken off, you, the body of Christ, could also be broken off. Um, and again, that doesn't mean anybody loses their eternal life, but it means the body of Christ would be broken off from that olive tree and would no longer have the position of that, that we have today of being God's agency of blessing on the earth and that would then mean the end of the dispensation of the grace of God. So the timing of the end of the dispensation of, gra of God is dependent upon this certain thing happening, which again, we'll talk about more next week. So that means it can't be imminent. So there's no chance that Christ could come tonight or that the rapture could, could be tonight because what he talks about here in chapter 11 must take place first before the dispensation of the grace of God can end. And clearly you can't have uh, the coming of Christ for us before the dispensation of grace ends. Um, you certainly have to have the dispensation of grace ending first uh, 
and then then Christ coming for us and removing us from the earth. So that means, um, again, that the rapture or the coming of Christ for us cannot be imminent, could not be tonight. What Paul talks about here must happen first. Until this happens, Christ cannot come for us um, and the dispensation of the grace of God cannot come to an end. So this chapter is not about Israel nor the body of Christ being removed from the earth. It's talking about being in the olive tree or removed from the olive tree. And again, when the body of Christ is removed from the olive tree, that's the end of the dispensation of the grace of God. But he's not talking again about being removed from the earth. All right, we will stop there for today, and um, next week we'll pick it up with the following verse and uh, see more specifically what it is that would cause the body of Christ to be removed from that olive tree. All right, thank you all. Thank Thanks. you, Dan. Hi, Jean.